Hello, everyone, and happy, happy 2020. Welcome to Right in Front of My Face, the podcast about big things happening right in front of us. I have been excited for this new year to hit because I am so excited to air this particular episode. This is episode number five, and it is my pleasure to introduce my friend Tan on this episode. Tan and I have known each other for many years. Tan is about four mm, ten, and while short in stature, she is huge on personality. The people that know Tan know that she is gregarious. She's fun. She's hilarious. She's a prankster. And I've also known that Tan was Vietnamese, but I didn't really know until I took the time to sit down and talk with her in this interview what her real story was. Tan's family is from a small province in Vietnam. Her father fought for the United States in the Vietnam War, which meant that after the war was over, Tan's entire family was shunned because they considered her father to be a traitor. What I think I didn't understand from the frame of reference of being a U.S. citizen is that the concept of generational shunning at that point in Vietnam was very real. The reality for Tan's family was that if they stayed in Vietnam, they all would have probably been, as Tan says, selling lottery tickets in the street. At the time that Tan's uncle offered to smuggle them out of Vietnam, Tan's parents had three small kids. Tan was the oldest at age five. Her brother was three and she had another brother who was nine months old. As I sat in my chair, listening to Tan tell me this story, all I could think about was my own five-year-old daughter. I have a child that age and I could not imagine being in the position of truly believing that smuggling my children on a boat to Malaysia was a more hopeful opportunity than staying in Vietnam. What this family had to go through after not only being on their boat for longer than they'd planned, as you'll hear about, but then finally getting to Malaysia, then getting transferred to a Filipino refugee camp, and then after years, finally being able to come into the United States is absolutely indescribable and incredible. Tan's story completely opened my heart and my mind to why it is so important for the U.S. to have open borders to refugees that need to come here. It wasn't my intent for this message to necessarily be political, but in this current time where this particular topic is so relevant, my hope is that we can hear this story with an open mind and an open heart because I truly had no idea what families honestly had to go through to get a U.S. passport. And for one, I am so thankful that Tan is here because she is my friend. Um, But there are so many people who come into the U.S. this way that we need to have in this country. So with the intent of starting this new year off with an open mind and an open heart, it is my true privilege and my true honor to introduce Tan. Hi, Tan. Hey, how are you, Shannon? (laughs) Uh, Welcome to Right in Front of My Face. Tan, how many years have we known each other? Oh, God, I think we've known each other since 2007. I was going to say, I was, yeah, like 2006 or 2007. It's been a really long time. So what year is it now? So almost like, what, 13, 15? We've known each other for a really long time. A long time. More than a decade. Birthday twins. Birthday twins, yes. But look exactly alike. That's right. I might be a little taller. (laughs) (laughs) So for those of you that cannot see Tan, Tan, how tall are you? I am four foot 10. Four foot 10 uh, at a powerhouse. Tan does, Tan does everything. Tan is a freelancer and one of the biggest hustlers I know, uh, has always had about 13 jobs at least. Right. Right. Uh, but Once I got to know Tan, which isn't that easy to do, you're, you're kind of a mystery wrapped in an enigma for a little bit. Sure. Yeah. I I come in and it's like, I'm like a little clown and then I run away. You are. You tend, so Tan is very silly at first when you meet her, she's very silly, very fun. But, um, once 
she opens up and starts telling you about herself, the onions of the, the onions, the layers of the onion, PLOA. And Tan has one of the more powerful stories I've heard. So Tan and I are the exact same age. I am from Spokane, Washington, was born in Eastern Washington. Tan, where were you born? I was born in uh, Vietnam. Where? Specifically? In Kamal, Vietnam. I actually just found my birth certificate. I went back and uh, found my birth certificate in the hospital where I was born. So No way. Instead Have of, you never had it before? I've never had my birth. I've never had a birth certificate. So that would, they issued me one. But my records, I was thinking, you know, I was born in 78. So it might be on a computer somewhere. No, they had this giant ledger book that had like our records in it. And I was like, can I touch that? They're like, no, <laughs> because it might fall apart. Cause it was, so is it like the library at Hogwarts? Like yes. they take the big book out? Pretty much. That's what it was because I was like, how did you find my records? They're like, it's right here in this book. I was like, wow. I, I was just. Okay. So know. I was born in Spokane. You were born in Vietnam. Come out of Vietnam. Yes. So the reason why I asked you to come on to right in front of my face is because you are a person who I've known for so many years and your story is again, so very different from my own in terms of being the same age and coming from a very different place. But your story is pretty spectacular to me because as there's so much talk about immigration and taking on refugees in the U S right now, you have the most amazing refugee story. And the fact that you and I can sit in the same room coming from where we have both come from is profound to me. So I would like you to take me and my listeners on the journey of your life, like take us with you, tell us, start from the beginning, tell us how you got here. And then after you've kind of taken us through your story, I want to talk about the work that you've started doing in Vietnam to kind of give back to this community and why that's so significant. So I, I do think it is very a significant, you know, situation that you and I right now sitting in your studio at the same time, we were born same age, yep. born the same day. Um, I was born uh, 1978, May 28. And I was born in Vietnam, but my, my dad, um, right after my parents got married, it was a few days later, he got hauled off to what uh, the Vietnamese government deemed at that time re-education camp. It was prison. He went to prison for two years, Shannon. He went to prison for two years. For what? Because he fought with the American side during the war. Okay, so you're born. When does the when does the war end? The war ended, I think, I'm, I'm 76, 75. Ish, yeah, the, there okay, really so is no day. But two years before two you years were before, Yeah, so born. they they just got married and then here comes the government. They're like, hey, we're taking you away. And when my, two years afterwards, they released my father. And then that's when he came home and then I was born. Um, okay. So you were born right after he got back from mm -hmm. prison. From, from prison. But re-education re camp is what they sure. called it. So, um, but after my dad was released. So when the Americans pulled out after the war, um, the communists took over. They're like, hey, any, anybody that fought on the other side we're going to re-educate you. Pretty much we're going to punish you for being a traitor. So my father was taken away for two years. And um, in those two years, my mom, you know, like traveled back and forth. It was a long journey to visit with him, to bring him food, to bring him, you know, treats. And when he came home was when I was born. But after that, we were, we were so poor at the time because imagine being the labeled the, the, the traitor. It's kind of like wearing a scarlet letter, you know, in Vietnam. This is what I find so interesting because I feel like as a U.S. citizen, this is something that's very difficult for like people born in the U.S. to understand that this idea of shunning is real. It's real. And like everybody agrees in Vietnam that if you fought for the U.S., you're done. Yeah. You're, you're pretty much a traitor. And even after my dad did his time in the re-education camp, um, we were, he couldn't hold down a job because they're like, oh, hey, when you, you know, go in to, to sign up for work, they have all your records. So it's not so like it's you like can change So it's like worse than being a felon here. Pretty much, pretty much. So my dad 
could not hold down a job. So we were super poor because my when we when they got married, we went and lived with my dad's side of the family. Okay. So my mom's side of the family was was more. They had a little bit more money, but um, you know. In the, in the culture, when you get married, you go live with your husband's family. Okay. And my mom didn't care. She's like, I'm not marrying you for your money. You know, like I married you because I love you. So, but when your dad can't hold down a job to buy you food right. two or three times a day, like, what do you do? You know? So what happened was my, my, my mom's brother at that time, there were so many people exiting Vietnam in like the thousands like yeah, that like it was a massive yes. migration out of Vietnam. So my my uncle, my mom's older brother, he's like, you know what? I feel so bad for you guys. I'm going to help you. You don't have to pay me anything. I'm going to give your whole entire family a free ride on my boat. Now, when I say boat, it's pretty much a fishing boat. But maybe it held, I know it held like 65 people. I mean, there are literal pictures of them online because yes. I did yeah. a, just a tad bit of research. Yeah. And, and I mean- the Vietnamese boat people is a real thing. It is well documented the migration out and the during the time that you're speaking of in the early eighties. So pretty much one night, my uncles like packed everybody up, packed everybody up, you know, um, and they in the middle of the night. And they, you were f- how old? Four. At that time, I was five. Okay, you're five. So I remember living because um, my my mom's side of the family lived right on the the Delta um, the Mekong uh, River. Okay, and. In the middle of the night, at midnight, like she woke me up. She's like, we're, we're, we're going to go for a little ride. So I was like, in the middle of the night, you know? But I remember my grandpa, Tom, which is my mom's father, okay. put me on a little rowboat. And we, like, quietly row from the shore onto, like, this fishing boat, which I don't know how many foot. I, know, like I 20, mean, 20. my daughter is almost five. She yeah. turns five in February. Yeah. And I could no more imagine, because I imagine you can't take anything. No, no. Um, and you're on a fishing boat. Yeah, we're on a fishing boat crammed with about 65 other people. So, I mean, it's just like everyone pays to be on this boat yeah. to be smuggled out. And you're thankful to be on it. We are thankful to be on it. Now, my mom did pack like, you know, a little bit of clothes. We had some food, um, maybe some jewelry, some medicine to take with us. But it, yeah, it's not like you can pack two suitcases. You know, we had like right. a little bag. So I remember being on this little rowboat and then being handed up to another And gentleman. you remember that. I remember this five. night. Yeah, being handed. And it's like, uh, you know, because sometimes to go from my dad's house to my mom's house, we have to take like a ferry boat. And it takes like, you know, all day long. So it's like, well, maybe we're going to dad's house now. You know, I didn't understand. So when we all got on and we were safely onto the fishing boat that was going to be smuggled out in the middle of the night because we had to sneak out because right. the government was watching. You know, if they catch you, you're, you're defectors and everybody go to jail, including the women and the children. So that after we made it past that port, it was like, OK. Whew. And so where were you going? Did you know? So uh, th- if we can get out of Vietnam and made it to like Malaysia, there was this island called Bidong Island. And that's where all of, so I didn't want people to think, oh yeah, we're on this fishing boat, very small fishing boat. There was 65, but people from Vietnam set sail for America. No, no. If you can make it to Bidong Island, which is Malaysia, which is, you know, maybe two days of sailing at that time, if you can make it to that island and get on it, you can be processed as refugees. That's where all the refugees were. That is a long time. It is. So to be on a boat with nothing, like you're talking about an open wooden yeah, boat, like a fishing boat. So we got on. So I remember we just got on and we, we settled. And my mom said to me, and I remember it verbatim, she goes, you're not going to see your grandma and grandpa ever again. And I started crying. I was like, I was five. I was like, why, why mom? In her heart, she knew like we're going on this journey and we're defectors and we're, we're, we're leaving our country. We're leaving our family. We're never going to see anybody again because we might die on the sea. Right. And that, that was her thinking, but me being a five-year-old, I didn't know that. So I was like, why, why am I not going to see grandma and grandpa? Again? <laughs> what are you talking so about? I started crying and that's when she put her hand over my mouth and she's like, Oh my God, crying. It's going to make noise. It's going to, you know, get attention from the police. Right. So she just covered my mouth and I, and I just, I remember that. Like, so now we're on this boat and I'm super sad because I'm like, not going to see any grandma or anybody ever again. And then I didn't understand that we were going on this journey. And 
about three or four days into this trip. So basically this, this boat is loaded up with people set and sail from Malaysia, from Bidal Island. And it's your, you, your mom and your dad, my mom, my dad, and my two little brothers. Okay. So Ben, he was, let's see, I was five, Ben we, we were two years apart. So he would have been three. And then son was like nine months. So son was just like Holy a baby, God, I mean. still breastfeeding. And we're on this boat, you know, um, headed for Malaysia. About the third or fourth day, it's, we're on waves. So the water supply breaks. So all the men are like, they took the drums of diesel oil and they're like, save the water, save the water. So we dumped the diesel and saved the water so that we have water to fresh water to drink. And they were able to save maybe a drum of, of drinking water because all the water was in um, little plastic containers that was okay. probably really cheap. So when the waves were, you know, the boat was going like, it, wait, would it, crack them? it cracked them. And then the water started leaking. And then the only thing we had to hold any liquid was oil drums. So we dumped the diesel oil. So we still have the diesel in the water. Exactly. We, they didn't have a chance to rinse it. Right. So they're like, just, just dump the drums. Just, just get the water, get save the, the water, water, save the water. So I remember like being really thirsty on day three or four. And I was like, why aren't we there yet? And I'm super thirsty. I want something to drink. And I'm seasick. I, I get seasick, air sick, car sick very easily. So I'm crying and I'm thirsty. And it's like, I just want some water, damn it. <laughs> and every day, everybody gets a ration of like a, a cap full of this diesel oil water. And I remember chugging my, my portion down and I just... I, I choked because I was like, what is this? This is not water. Yeah. It's not Kool-Aid. It's, this, this is disgusting. And <laughs> you're drinking fuel. I'm drinking diesel fuel pretty much mixed with water. And I just, it was, it was miserable. And that continue on. Cause this is now guess what? Our boat is dead. Cause there's no more diesel. We can't sail anymore. So now it's just floating on the water. And about a week into it, we see land. It's not. You stay on this boat for a week? Uh huh. Yeah, a week. They're like dehydrated, sick. Um, there's Where like, do people go to the bathroom? I mean, it's small. Like, are you it, going over the side of the boat? Yeah, pretty much over the side of the boat. Well, this, that's a good question because um, at sometimes we were down in the cabin where, where the engine was. This one young lady, I remember, she didn't want to, because, you know, she's like, I don't want the men to see my butt when I go pee. So she went down into the cabin and she was wearing long pants with like bell bottom legs. Well, it got caught. Her pants leg got caught into the propeller. Her oh. leg got pulled into oh my God. the engine propeller. And she had like a massive wound on her leg. I remember that. And my brother, Ben, also at some point fell into the engine because of the waves. And this is after us. He's like, hey, we're, we're hungry. We're thirsty. He fell in too. And someone grabbed him. So his side of, I think his right thigh was also like he had a massive wound. Wow. And he survived. So now, okay, a week now, we've been kind of just floating in the middle of the ocean. And someone's like, we see land, we see land. So someone took a part of the boat and they paddled towards the land. So now it's been about a week. And we, you're adrift in the we're middle? Adrift, in the middle of the, the ocean. Pacific Ocean, yeah. Yeah. And so we, they found this deserted island. There's nobody on it. So we are somewhere in Malaysia now. Okay. We go in No there. one knows where you are. Nobody knows where we are. Nobody knows. We don't know where we are. Right. But, um, we get on this island, we tie up the boat and they took all the women uh, and children and they put us in this circle and they, they, they kind of lit a ring of fire around us because they're like, it could be wild animals on here. You know, this is a deserted island. Oh my God. And then, but I remember um, getting fresh water because there was water. That's all I care about. I was like, I was so thirsty and I'm off the boat. I'm on, you know, and they, so that night we slept inside that ring of fire, everybody. And then the, um, some of the men went to the other side of the island and lit the whole thing on fire as a signal. Yeah. So we, the next morning we woke up, well, somebody didn't tie the boat up very well. It floated away. So now- most of our stuff that was left on the boat. Oh, our boat my is God. gone. Our boat is gone. It floated away in the middle of the night. So now we're stuck on this island with no boat. And um, we have water, but very little food. Okay. I just want to clarify. I have never heard this story in this much detail before. Yeah. And I literally, like, I can't close my mouth. 
This is unbelievable. Yeah. So your boat floats away. Boat floats away. But thank God, um, there's a lot of Malaysian fishermen, and they knew that fire signal because there are so many of us out there, like how many hundreds of boats, right? So um, this giant Malaysian fishing vessel, so it's not a boat, it's a vessel. They sent in like um, some people on a little dinghy and without speaking each other's language, they knew who we were. We knew who they were and they made gestures that you know give us your watches your gold your jewelry we're like yes great great it's it's worthless at this point exactly so we gave them because that's what people bring you know to this new land is they they have gold they have jewelry they have watches so we gave them a bunch of stuff i saw the adults do it and they took all 65 of us including my brother and me you know with the my brother with the massive wound on his leg and um they put us all on their boat and they gave us food that night. I, I remember getting to eat like a little bit of sardine because I, have, I haven't eaten in days. I've been drinking. I can't believe you can remember all this. I remember all this. I haven't like blocked it out. Uh, I remember all this. I mean, I just remember being how miserable it is to be seasick and dehydrated and crying because like at that point, I, I wasn't even, you know, missing my grandparents. It's like, I just want to drink a water. And I remember asking dad, like, dad, can can we have some lemonade when we get there? So have you gone back at any point and asked your mom what that was like for her as a parent of three little kids? Yeah. And, you know, my mom shared with me that um, I didn't see any of this. She said, I was holding you guys and I saw dead bodies floating in the ocean. And she's like, I said to myself, today, that's them. Tomorrow, that's going to be us if we don't get rescued. I mean, I cannot imagine making that choice and that choice being your best choice. Exactly. And and like that is the thing that I keep thinking, like that was the best choice for your family. Like my mom and dad knew putting the entire family on this boat. The risk is like opportunities in America or death. Right. And they still chose, hey, let's take that risk. And I am so thankful that they did because had we stayed, um, you know, the, 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 the scarlet letter I, I was talking about, like my dad being fought, fighting for the American side, that would have affected me, the for second sure. generation. Like I would never be able to get a proper education there or a job. I mean, again, to me, that's so shocking being a U.S. born woman. The idea of not only just shunning, but like generational shunning. Yes. So not just my dad, but it no. would have affected me too as his, his children. Yeah. Um, his children would have been like shunned also. And we, you know, I, I don't know how deep it would have gone, but I was told by my relatives, like, you're so lucky that you left and then you made it to America because had you stayed here, like your life right now, you would be like selling lottery tickets on the street. That. You would not be educated. So, I mean, I sit here today with a, a, a fantastic job that I love, a career that I love. Yeah. And, you know, I got to go to college. I was the first in my uh, in my family to be able to go to college. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. But go back to your rescue. So you're rescued so by get back, Malaysian. Let's get back on the boat. So we, we that night, they put us on the boat. I got some food. I got some water to drink. Had our boat still been on uh, the ocean that day. It was a, I remember just yeah, a huge storm. Just we were on the deck and we just washed over by waves after waves after waves because they couldn't. You know, this this actually I remember how massive the boat was. It was like a giant fishing Malaysian fishing boat. And after that night, we made it to. They brought us to Bidong Island, and they took us all off and they started processing us. So we were. Rescued. We, we made it. We made it. Not on our boat, but on someone else's boat. Thank God. So we ended up at, uh, processing on Bidon Island, I think for another six months. And they, they had like little bungalows uh, for us to live in. And then from there, they processed us onto another um, station in Malaysia also. Okay. And they t- I remember they took us by boat again, on like speedboats, to um, another camp in, in Malaysia. From Bidon Island. And How do you feel about getting on that boat? <laughs> <laughs> you know, at, the, at that point, I was like, I kind of forgotten. But I was like, oh, this boat goes much faster. Because I remember it was a speedboat. <laughs> Our oh boat was just like a... But we, we got onto that. We got there. And that was like another six months. to. So they just kind of moved us around um, so that they could process everybody. 
And then it wasn't until this is like hundreds of thousands of people that are moving. Oh yeah. 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 We're among a, yeah. And we like, you know, we lived in cramped quarters. It wasn't just like everybody got a house or, but I mean, I, I just, I didn't know what was going on. I just knew like, Hey, we have to move again, you know? And I was just making the most of it. And you know what, you know, exactly. When you're five, six, seven, yeah, like you know I, what, you know, I didn't know like America. I didn't know we were trying to go to America. I didn't know what America was. You didn't know that I got a poochie when I was five for mm-hmm. Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't know about my little buddies. No. And like, you didn't know I, about taking a nap at kindergarten. No. I mean, I, that's what I was. That's what I was living when I was that age. Yeah. So when you, when you were five, you get a poochie. When I was five, I got a piece of sardine on a, on a, a Malaysian fishing vessel. And then that to me was like Christmas. I was like, Oh my God, a piece of food when I haven't eaten for a week. Unbelievable. So anyway, we get processed, Bidong Island, another place in Malaysia. In Malaysia, on the second um, refugee camp, was where my sit, my uh, my brother Joe was conceived. <laughs> so sounds, now, now, now thinking back, I was romantic, like, Tam. I was like, I was thinking back, I was like, oh my god, that is gross. My parents had sex in the refugee god, camp. Right? Oh well, I guess God. What else are you gonna do? You know? <laughs> and then Joe was born. Joe was born um, when we got to the Philippines. So we six months there, and then we spent another seven. So pretty much the, the, the journey from the time I left Vietnam to the time I got to America was two years. Okay. And those two years were divided up into three camps. The last camp was uh, in the Philippines. And that was where my parents were all taken into, um, they, they were like allowed to go to school to learn English, ESL. And then in the Philippines, um, that's where they had Americans, the French, the uh, Australians, and Germany was there. And then you, they would call you, they would interview you and they would say, okay, uh, you know, the Americans say, okay, Tan and your family, we're going to take you, we're going to accept you as political, uh, refugees. And, um, so there, remember in the Philippines, there was a list every week and you would run up to the list. And if your family's name was on there, that means like somebody, like one of those countries chose you and you could go interview with them. And just for every week, it's just like, oh, we're not on the list. We're not on the list. And, and so you are just waiting. Are there at these camps, do they have like schools set up? Do they have like, is it a community? Like, what's it like? It's it's pretty much bungalows. And we lived off rations, um, you know, and because our family, we, we had, there was me, Ben, son. And then now there's little Joe who was just born. Well, Joe wasn't born yet in the beginning. So there was like, well, that's five of us, mom and dad, right? Five yeah. kids. So our rations were a little bigger. So I was, you know, I, I hustled my whole life. So I used to take our, sometimes we get like fresh uh, chicken. Cause most of the time it was just like dry noodles and, yeah. and you know, whatever. But when we get like the, the dry fish and fresh chicken, um, we would eat half of it. And my mom will give me the other half of our food rations. I would take it to the market and I would uh, sell it to the people at the market because they loved our stuff. And I didn't speak any Filipino or English, but I would take a little piece of paper and I knew how much I wanted for it. And I would write down a number and I would pass it to them, you know, like how you would buy a yeah, car here. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, and, and they, they write a number and I was like, nope, I write back my number. And I would bring that money back to, uh, home to my mom and she would save it up. So remember that list that I talked about. So we were there. Um, there was no school for us. There was school for my parents. So I would watch okay. the children while they were in school. And then my mom, she was very. So it's seven, seven. You're watching your so little brothers. At that sisters. time, I'm probably six now. Yeah, so yeah, so I'm, I'm watching, you know, all the kids while my parents are in school learning English. Yeah, so you have I mean, this is a lot of responsibility yeah. for a little kid. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, and then my mom, she learned how to make sticky rice. So in the morning she would, you know, I wake up with her at four o'clock in the morning, help her make the big pot of sticky rice, help her carry the table out to the market and be show her classes and start to like eight o'clock. So four o'clock we're up and cooking and then help her sell sticky rice. And that's how we made money. We had a little bit of, of cash to buy extra food. And then one day I remember my mom came or my dad came home and he's like, our name is on the list. We were so excited. We finally got on the list. And it was the Americans that um, gave us political asylum because my dad fought for the American side. 
in the war. So it made sense. And so. also my mom had a little brother that came the same way and he was already here. So they wanted to reunite the family. So we were so excited. And I remember we were so excited running around like, we're going to America, we're going to America. And um, the money that I made hustling our, our rations and the money my mom saved up from selling sticky rice at the market. She was able to buy us each a new brand new pair of shoes at the market so that we could have a pair. Of sh- we didn't have shoes actually. I mostly, I remember walking around barefoot. Um, but when we got on the plane to go to America, I remember it was the ugliest pair of shoes for me. She bought me jellies. I hate jellies. <laughs> I always wanted jellies. I, I hated jellies, but they, they hurt my feet. And yeah, they're uh, not these were not the shoes I wanted. But the significance of each of, of each of us having a new pair of shoes to wear to America was. So that's <sighs> it. You spent two years getting to the Philippines. You're there. You have a brother born. Yeah. The U.S. grants you political asylum. How yeah. do you pay for a plane ticket or does the U.S.? So they, they pay, okay. they, they paid for our ticket and they gave us a ticket and we flew into, I think LAX and our uncle came up and, and, and got us. So when I came to America, Shannon, I did not speak one word of English. I was seven or seven. So they're like, Hey, we'll just start you in first grade. I was like, okay, sure. So for the first three years, oh my God. first three so years, you had, so you come from a refugee camp with no shoes, hustling fresh chicken. And you're living in LA? No, we, uh, we, we flew into LAX, you but flew we, into LAX, we then, moved to San Diego. So my uncle okay. rented like a two bedroom apartment for, you know, our family and him to live in. And we lived in a uh, little apartment in San Diego. And so then they're like, well, you're here. Good luck, Tan. <laughs> yeah, here's, so, public, here's some public school. Like, yeah, go figure so, it out. So now like, Hey, we got to get all the children into school. So for the first three years of school, I didn't speak any English. So I remember my teachers were not very kind to me. Well, I didn't know because they, I remember the, uh, in my report cards, I would look back and it's just like, Tan is very aggressive. I was like, well, I'm not aggressive because I don't understand what you're saying. So I remember one day I was on the playground and I, I said, come here to somebody, but I used my middle finger to wave him over. Right. I did not know the middle finger, just the middle finger a is a, a gesture, is a bad gesture. So I got hauled off into the principal's office and I don't know what's going on. It's like, what did I do? I just asked someone to come over so I could borrow their toy. Yeah. So for the first three years, um, they put me in an ESL class to mm-hmm. learn and um, I would go home. And so I would go to ESL um, while everyone else was doing their normal lessons. And I would go home and I would watch Sesame Street. I would uh, read uh, Dr. Seuss books and I would just watch movies and I would just listen. So by the third grade, I was able to test out of the ESL and back into the regular uh, reading classes with with my peers. So by the third grade, I was like, oh, okay, I'm I'm starting like I can read now and I can write. That's amazing. So only two years. God, kids are amazing. Yeah. You're, you're also amazing. I don't know about that, but so, so Dr. Seuss books and Sesame Street. <laughs> There's something to that, right? As it turns out. Yeah. Big Bird. Big Bird helped me. Okay. So you, you're in San Diego for how long? We lived in San Diego for, and I slept on the couch cause I didn't get a room. I slept on the couch with my uncle. We lived in San Diego for a total, so 80, 85 to about 97. And then okay. 97 was when we moved up here to Seattle. So you went through high school with the high school and then you moved to Seattle because mm-hmm. I'm just thinking like I was still in Portland in 96 graduated. Mm-hmm. I started college in 97. So where'd you go to school? So I only had maybe a few more months of high school left was when my parents. Um, so going back a little bit, when we first came to America, uh, we were in school and my dad wasn't the best provider anyway. So my mom had a skill sewing. So mm-hmm. she learned how to drive. And um, I mean, when we got here, you know, we were on welfare, we're in food stamps, all of that. Um, but then she's like, well, I can't just go get a job because I don't speak the language. So she learned how to drive. And then she found um, a sewing machine, like an industrial one, not the one that, you know, grandma makes a quilt. She got yeah, an yeah. industrial machine. My, my uh, uncle bought it for her and she just found this factory in LA that was owned by another Vietnamese lady. And she's like, Hey, can I get some piecemeal work from you? And she goes, I have a sewing circle. I have other ladies yeah. that need work. So she would like, 
I would come home from school. I would sit and we got a van. It was like a cargo van. I would sit in the passenger side and I would study my spelling words and, you know, do my homework and go with mom from LA or from San Diego to LA and then get these, you know, like 5,000 t-shirts and then mom will bring it back and then she would drop it off to her lady friends. Like, so let's say, you know, so-and-so put together the torso and then at the end of the week, the entire t-shirt was put together and I think at the time, maybe for a whole shirt, you got $2. So my mom would get a part of that $2. And then that's how she generated income. And I would go and I would help her carry the stuff. Because I don't, at this point, my dad was really not involved in our lives. I mean, he he Are your parents still together at that point? They were still together. But my dad's like, oh, we made America. You take care of the kids and I'll, you know, go drink and gamble and come home and hit you, you know? So it, it was... It wasn't easy. Like, imagine coming to America, not knowing one word of English, and then like, everything's new to you. Like, I drink milk, and I was like, what is this shit? It tastes like crap. I didn't it would realize. be like planting me in the middle of Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. And like, the coach, <laughs> like, like, you have no family no except for, for your mom, dad, brother, sister, and your and uncle. And also, coming from, like, such a rural place to, like... Right, to the city. To the city. Like, yeah. That's a huge change. Right. So, I mean, I had to relearn everything, like the food that I ate. And I, now, now I love milk, but when you, when I first drank milk, cause I was expecting it to be sweet. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, but no, growing up, I, I love Kool-Aid. Punch flavor was my favorite, but you know, like relearning everything, relearning a culture, relearning a language. And it, it, it was hard because I felt like part of my childhood was robbed from me. By my yeah. dad not being a part of, like I had to step in and kind of be the father figure to, um, now this is, this is another, uh, funny point to point out. So my parents didn't speak English at all. So at a uh, parent teacher conferences, I was a parent. Oh, you're a translator. I was a translator. So <laughs> when it came to like my stuff, I was like, oh yeah, mom, dad, I'm doing great. <laughs> Tia's doing great. I am amazing. That's exactly what <laughs> I, she's exactly, saying. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't do nothing wrong. I'm so fantastic. Grow, growing up, I had to grow up pretty fast. Yeah. And when we got to America, I was sometimes the mom and the dad. Where were your brothers? So my, my brothers were, they were living with us, you know, but they were younger. So, yeah. um, I mean, at eight, eight, I was writing checks to pay the electric bill because my parents my eight-year-old can't, still can't tie his shoes. <laughs> just so we're clear. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. So it's just, I mean, out of my situation, I had to grow up pretty fast. I had to, you know, I mean, I was ba- babysitting when I was five. Yeah. By my siblings and taking care of them. And Yeah, you know. I mean, you are totally forced into right. the situation. So how does it feel that your parents aren't trying to learn the language? Is that a frustrating point for you or is it, it just is what it is? For my mom and um, my mom passed away in 2015. So she had a massive stroke. So that was um, really sad. But for my mom, she didn't, she, she wanted to, but she didn't have the time. She was always working to, to put food on a table for us. And then for my dad, he, he could have had the opportunity to actually go take classes, but he was too busy, you know, drinking and going and having his affairs. So it's, for me, I feel like it, it's a burden to answer that question. It's a burden that your parents didn't speak the, the language here. And yeah, I mean, you, that is like a huge responsibility it is, for you. It is. Like, I mean, I was telling you, I'm at eight, I'm writing the checks to pay all the bills. And every, every time, you know, every new year, school year, all the forms come in. I have to fill all that stuff out for my brothers and sisters. Um, all the phone calls, anything. I was the translator. I was mom. I was dad. I was, you know. All of it. I was the parent. And now looking back then, I was like, this is not fair. You know, when I was a kid, I was like, this is not fair. I should be outside playing with my friends, not in here paying the cable bill. Right. (laughs) But looking back though, I think that just made me the person who I am now. Cause I, to me, I, I'm driven. You, You give me a task. If I can't do it, yeah, you're, I mean, way, you are arguably will, one of the most driven people I, I have find, ever met. I will find a way to do it. And, and and I think, you know, thinking back, it's like, okay, I was kind of mad at my parents for making me the parent when I was a kid. But um, now it's just made me the person who I am. So do your parents stay together? They, my parents were together on and off until I was about 24. And then that's when my mom left my dad. Had enough. 
he had enough. And that was the last time I pretty much saw him. I mean, I saw him at my mom's funeral, but you know what? My dad was, he was not a good father. He was not a good father. He, he had a part in making me and my brothers and sister, you know, Yeah. but, um, raising us, it was all mom. It was all my mom. So you moved to Seattle in 97. What brought you guys up here? So at that time, a lot of the work was being sent, uh, the piece mill work was being sent to Mexico because it was cheaper to, to have the stuff. So, so my dad actually had a friend who was his, uh, lieutenant in the army oh. in Vietnam. He, he, they found each other and he goes, he had a factory up here that made backpacks for East Pack and Jansport. He goes, bring your entire family up here. I'll give everybody a job. No way. Yeah. So we all moved up here. And at first I was, again, I was angry because I had maybe a few more months, four or five months of school left. Yeah. And, and I mean, had that's like a big deal. And it was my senior year for you. Mm hmm. And I had made so many um, good friends down in San Diego and at, at Kearney High School. That's where I was. And one day my dad just came home and said, we're moving. It, it wasn't like, hey, let's talk about this. Like, we're moving next month. Pack your stuff up. We're moving. And then I had to start over, you know, um, up here. I went to, where did I go? I went to Nathan Hill High School up here. And you just like, do you move? And then the next day you start this new school and you're like, yeah, I just got to finish much. this. Pretty much, I just got to, you know, finish. I mean, there was like senior projects that I came in and I had to start over, you know, because when you're a senior, there's a lot of projects for yeah, you to do. a lot of Yeah, work. and then just making new friends in a new um, city. Had you applied to schools at that point? Um, like for college? Mm -hmm. See, I knew at that point I was a little lost. <laughs> I well, yeah, but I mean, your parents generally are the people that help you through that. So if you don't have that. I didn't know. Of course you're. I, lost I and, and, and like on many levels. I remember uh, this is like before maybe I was a sophomore in, in high school in, in San Diego. Okay. And I remember wanting to go to UCLA to, to study the film program. Cause I, I knew when I was like 13 uh, videography is, is where I, that's where it's at for me. But my dad was like, no, you, you can't go to school far away. We need you at home. You, we need you. You can't move away. So yeah. Cause you're like an income earner. You're a translator. Like literally yeah. they couldn't. So I felt like, which it. sucks. It sucked because I was like, damn it. I can't even move away to go to college. I have to like stay here and translate and read the mail and, you know, write the check. So I was pretty pissed. But um, right after high school, actually, I <laughs> ended up in the military for about three years. And that was. Oh, my God. That's man. another. That was another story. I didn't. I, I forgot that. I ended up in the in the Army Reserve for like three years because I was trying to get to a Debbie Gibson concert and, and they're like, hey, you could fly for your government airlines. So I was like, shut uh, up. That yeah. is not the real that story. Is, that is, I swear to God, on my life. <laughs> that is how I ended up in the Army. Uh, that, to get to Debbie Gibson. Does Debbie Gibson know that? I don't think so. Oh my but, God. Uh, I hope I was, this finds her. Somebody please. I'm tweeting Debbie Gibson. At that point I was, I was living, I was living actually in San Diego was when I signed up for the, the uh, and I was trying to get to New York cause her, her convention, it was a Debbie Gibson convention. <laughs> well, you're not just, I mean, you're not just going to go to the show. Right. I, I wanted to go. So uh, like I told you, I was probably 16 at the time Oh my God. and I was like, I'm finding a way to get there. And then a uh, long story short, I, I signed up. But that summer, they're like, you got to go to boot camp. I was like, I'm not going to boot camp because I'm going to the Debbie Gibson convention. They're like, no, you go to boot camp because you signed here. You're like, I'm, the army is like, I'm sorry. I don't think you understand how this works. <laughs> That's exactly what it was like my, uh, my sergeant, the one that Surprise. the red recruiter, she's like, yeah. So I, I threw a fit and they're like, okay, we're going to do the, we're just going to wait until you graduate for you to do boot camp. So I had to go get a job at Wiener Schnitzel making like $3 and 25 cents oh, an hour. And that's how I found, I, I bought a ticket to the convention and bought a, a airline ticket to go to New York. So I made it to New York to go see Debbie, yeah, but it was not free on the government airline. Like they promised me. And then when I graduated high school, I was like, Oh shit. I, I, Sorry, this contract. I still have to go into the army. I gotta go. That's how I ended up in the army for about three years. So did, I mean, seriously, did you honestly not realize that you'd have to serve? No, I was, Chan, I was 16. <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> I, was, I was like this stupid little kid. Like my thing on my mind was like, I was like, okay, I, I get to wear this uniform. They're like, it's not, you know, it's, it's fun. I was like, yeah, I, yeah. You yeah. don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm 16. 
No, and clearly your dad has not communicated what being in the army is like. No. Oh, and then when, when I got to boot camp, I was like, I was crying because it was, <laughs> I had to wake up at five o'clock in the morning. I was not a good fit. I was not a good fit. So, and you know, they, my job was like, I was a 92 Yankee. So I was a paper pusher, a supply specialist. It's like, that is not the job I wanted, but that was what they had. And I, at that point, I didn't care because it was like, okay, as long as it gets me a free ride on the government airplane to go to New York, <laughs> that's what I care about. <laughs> so this is, you know, but I got out after three years and then I said, um, what am I going to do with my life? And I said, look, Art Institute. Yeah. Sign up for it. I, uh, I got accepted and then I went for two years and got my degree in video production and I got out and I got a job and that's where I am ever since. Sometimes I still have to wake up early. I still cry when I have to wake up early. I, I'm not a wake up early person. <laughs> oh my God, Tan, that is just an unbelievable like survival story and it does explain a whole lot of things, but your personality is not congruent to rules. No. So like the story about you going into the army is, is really just unbelievable, but you lasted. I mean, like everything else in your life, you did it, you survived, you're done. And now you don't have to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so fast forward. So you and I met working at a little company called screenplay at the mm -hmm. time. And you were in our videographer, like you have managed to like make your passion, your, income at what point do you decide to start going back to Vietnam? So, uh, you know, the, the first time we went back to Vietnam was when I was, um, like 10 years after we left and that was great. And, and we missed my oh, family. So that's pretty recent. I mean, that was like you left, but 10 years later, you yeah. So I think in 91 was when, okay. um, the, the Bush administration is like, Hey, let's just sign this treaty. Everything's forgotten. So the government's like, okay, all the people that defected, it's all forgiven. Now you could come back, come back. Just kidding. Yeah, we're not going to do this generational shunning anymore. Exactly. It we're not going to policy. As we're not going to throw you in jail. You're not going to, you know, there's no prosecution. So, I came back, I think in 93 with the whole family, my mom was back. But then, you know, after that, it was just like, we, we go back maybe five years, but it wasn't until, um, I met Hillary Brown in 2015 and, uh, how Hillary and I met was very serendipitous. Um, we met through like a mutual friend. So I used to travel the world in the cow suit. I just had this cow suit. I know. Tell people about the cow suit though. Cause it was a thing. It was a thing. It is. It's still kind of a thing, but my friend Josh gave me this cow suit. It's, it's literally a cow suit that he wore in his band. He goes, Tan, I'm going to pass it down to you wherever the world you go, you put it on and you take a picture. So I started like this wall in my, um, at home cow pictures. So, you know, there's a picture of the cow in Paris, a cow in Venice, a cow in Switzerland. And, um, and then when my mom died, I was just really, I was shaken. I was sad. And my friend, Kathy, she goes, Tan, let's do something with your cow suit and make it, you know, meaningful. And um, when my mom died, I travel a lot just to get away from everything and everybody. And that's when the, the, the my little travel blog called The Traveling Cow started. And it was just pictures of me in my cow suit. And I meet people. I have dinner with them. I go in the house. And, and then I write a story about them. Yeah. And, it and it, I mean, it and it was Caught like on. the most amazing stories that people open up to me because, you know, uh, I guess when you're wearing a cow suit, you're not as intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> your guard is down. Exactly. And they, they sit there and they talk to you and they pull on your udders, you know, it's like, Hey, you're, you're my cow friend now. And I found <laughs> out just friend. that, just having that little suit on, you know, make like open up so many doors into so many homes for me and getting so many stories. So, and then I, I met, uh, somebody wrote a story like MLB or something. And then I've met a friend through that story that lived in, her name was Chris Lai. She lived in Oregon. And then Chris Lai and I was, became Facebook friends, you know, cause she's also Vietnamese and we, she, she came to America the same way. So we connected through that. And uh, fast forward maybe two years after that, 2015, one night, I remember going to bed and then a little message popped up. It goes bling. And I'm like, who the hell was writing, you know, to my Facebook thing at, at this hour, it's two o'clock in the morning. I just, you know, I just got done working and I was like, Oh, I'll read in the morning. But something said, Nope, open that, open that message up or, uh, and read it right now. And it was so long. And I was like, I hate long messages. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> who, who dares write me this many words? <laughs> exactly. 
exactly <laughs> at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but pretty much it was um, Chris Sly saying, hey, she shared Hillary Brown's message. And Hillary Brown's thing was, you know, um, she was all for this random act of kindness. And there was um, this um, boy named Dalton who lives in Haines, Alaska. And Dalton has uh, epidermolysis bullosa, which is called EB, which is a, a very rare genetic skin disease that affects your skin. So it's like your whole body blisters and you die a very slow, painful death. There's no cure. So Dalton, bless his heart, he was actually 20 at the time. So he My was, God. yeah. And he was coming down from Haines, Alaska to have a procedure, a medical procedure done at the University of Washington. And Hillary at that time was living in, in um, Israel. And she's like, hey, everybody, Dalton's going in for this procedure. You know, if you have to time, please send him a card, send him a, a nice word of kindness, just encouragement. He's having this done. And he's here at this um, UW medical facility. And Chris Lai knows I live in Seattle. Mm -hmm. so that's why she connected me with that. So that long message was actually Hillary writing. You know, Hillary likes, I mean, she writes with like hieroglyphics. And to me, it's like, I have a problem reading already. So when there's like pictures in there, like, what's, I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> But guess what? Against my judgment, because I was like, I'm going to bed. I was, I was going to delete it. But yeah. I opened it up. I read it. And I put in the comments, um, it wasn't a message. It, it was like on my timeline. And I put in the comments, um, I will make sure Dalton gets some love. Because the next day, I was shooting uh, baseball at the University of Washington, which is like, you know, a five-minute yeah. walk to the hospital. So the next day, I came into work about an hour and a half early. I walked through the hospital and I went in and I met Dalton and his mom. No way. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know this, but I, I, they, Hillary and them have never met. So I said, Hey, I found out about you from Hillary and brought you a little treat. Um, hope you're doing well. And I said, can I please have a picture of you and your mom so I could send to Hillary, let her know that I came in here and, you know, saw you today. And they're like, yes, yes. So I take a picture and <clears throat> when I'm working the baseball game in between innings, I sent Hillary this, um, this picture. Oh, going back, um, I, I wrote in that night. Um, so it was like two o'clock in the morning in Seattle and it's probably like what, 10, 12 o'clock. Uh, Israel time. In Israel time. So Hillary was already up. I'm getting ready to go back. And, and I wrote, um, you know, and then Hillary jumps in and then I realize her name is also, so on Facebook, I'm Tan Brown. You know, it's two colors, Tan Brown. Yep. And her name is Hillary Brown. And then I, I, she jumped in and she's like, oh my gosh, you know, that made me smile or something. And I said, ha ha, brownies unite. And then that was the beginning of our beautiful friendship. We started, um, you know, like messaging back and forth. I found out she has a charity. And then talking to her like a week later, we, we started talking about all this stuff. And four, it turns out four years ago, I saw her in this video of, of, of another kid in Vietnam. His name was Hui. And Hui also had epidermolysis bullosa. And when we, she, she brought that up, I was like, she goes, well, how do you know so much about EB? I was like, well, you know, about four years ago, I saw this video on Facebook and um, I looked it up. And that's why I knew a lot about this, crazy. this really rare disease. And then she started talking about Hui. And then I was like, wait a minute. There cannot be two kids in Vietnam with EB, which is a very rare genetic you know, skin yeah. disease, named Hui that has this disease. So I go on to, uh, after, like, what, as I'm talking to her, I go on um, YouTube and I find that video that I saw four years ago. I'm talking. And it's the same one. It's the same lady in That's the crazy. video. I'm talking to Hillary Brown. The lady, because in the video, the guy goes, Hillary, Hillary. I didn't know who she was. I just, like, knew she's amazing. She does all this. Yeah. And then here I am talking to her. So she started telling me about her charity, Helping Orphans Worldwide, how for short. So as I'm talking to her, I go on her website and I go, God, your website is so dated. You need a new website. You need a new video. So it's like, you know, I'm going to. I'll help you out. I'm going to help you out. So after talking to her for a couple of weeks, I was like, okay, I can fly out. And this is March. I'll fly out at the end of May when I get a little break in work and I'll help you make a new video for your charity. And, uh, Call it good, you know? Yeah. Like that was my good deed for the so day. How do you feel? How do you feel going back to Vietnam? I mean, I, I'm going to come back to how, but what does it feel like for you to go back? The first, now? the first time I went back, I was just like, oh my God, like, uh, it was my family, you know, like grandma yeah. and grandpa. Cause imagine growing up as a kid with no cousins, no grandma, no grandpa, like, you know, around yeah. the holidays, yeah. all your friends and, uh, go 
to their family, you mm-hmm. know, and we didn't really have family. So for me, like the holidays were kind of shitty because yeah. um, my dad would come home drunk and beat my mom and then I would have to call the cops and then he would go to jail and then you come back to school and the teacher's like, Oh, you know, what did you do over? Sounds your- like a wonderful Christmas holiday. Right. Yeah. So for me, I hated it. But then when we started going back to Vietnam, it's like, this is what I was missing. My aunts, my uncles, this is what I didn't have during the holidays was this. Did you ever want to move back? No, 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 no. Of course not. It was too hot. <laughs> Honestly, I can never live in Vietnam because it's, it's, too hot for me. It's hot. Yeah, it's very hot. And I, I can't deal with the humidity. It makes my hair all frizzy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there will be a picture of Tan up on my website. <laughs> she does not have a lot of hair to be frizzy. Um, so you don't want to move back, but it's like joyous for you to go back and find that like and, piece of yourself that and was missing. So going back, when I met Hillary, it was couple of years after my mom so when my mom died that was my my world just crushed you know she was my world my mom was she raised us and when she died I took a I I went down a really dark hole for like a year I didn't really want to talk to anybody Mm -hmm. I was I was very dark you know I I didn't want to live I I didn't want to just not like you at all exactly and my friends noticed it and then that's when I started traveling as a cow and that hope a little bit because I was like, I was so angry when my mom died, Shannon, because I was like, I was angry at the world. And I got, I was like, why did you take my dad? My dad's a jerk. <laughs> take my dad, leave my yeah. mom. It was so unfair. It's like, you threw me into this new world with ma- a mom and a dad and a dad that was, you know, that didn't, bailed. that bailed on us. But then mom like raised us to be good citizens and, and, and good people. And then just when I'm about to be able to like repay her for all that, like you just take her, like suddenly she died of a massive stroke. That was it. She wasn't sick. She wasn't anything. She just died. I just got a call and was like, come to the hospital. And the doctor comes out and like, sorry, kids, there's nothing we can do for your mom. That was it. And then also, once again, you're sort of thrust into the position of being the parent. Exactly. Being the parent and being, so you've got four brothers and now I am the, 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 is it the, the matriarch and the patriarch? Cause we had no right. dad, you know? So yeah, I, I feel like in a, so when I met Hillary, I was, I was coming out of a very, very, very dark place and for, to talk to her and realize that she, Hillary just has a bubbly personality to begin with. So when I talked to her, I was like, First of all, she's like ADHD, so we could have like 70 conversations in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but when she started talking about the work that she did, and I felt like I needed to be a part of that. So my, my first thing was like, okay, I'll come out. I came, you know, I, I called my friends. I was like, hey, I need your help. I want to buy, because she told me about the perpetual giving program, you know, about, about buying the cows and chickens for um, the needy family. So I was like, I need your help. I need a couple thousand dollars so I could buy two cows. <laughs> and guess what? My friends and family, they trusted me. So when I call them, they. they so, get- but explain that though, because the perpetual giving program is actually pretty incredible. It is. So it's, it's, it's a program that Hillary started with helping orphans worldwide. How? So not only did they help orphans, they help families of the orphan or of, you know, other families that are in need. So she started that program in 2014. And basically she works with the women's union in Vietnam. They select the families and then she comes in with the donations and they, they buy. So it costs a thousand us dollars to buy one cow and maybe $65 for a pig. But they would pair these families up with like, let's say, you know, uh, the Smith, they get a cow and 70 chickens and two pigs. So the chickens, they lay eggs. They could eat the eggs and you could sell the chicks for money. And then the pigs, I mean, pigs have babies, I think every six or seven months. Yeah. So that's like coming in and giving families tools and resources to actually create a sustainable income. Exactly. And then when I heard that, um, thank you. Thank you for uh, helping me explain that better. But when I heard that, I was like, that is a great idea. I mean, that's basically the teach a man a fish. Yeah, it's exactly, that's exactly what it is. So that's why I was like, I call my friends. I was like, I I need you guys to help me buy two cows. So that's like about two grand. So all my friends and family, like they 
I came to Vietnam um, three months later, handed Hillary a check, and then I went into the field with her. And we, I actually bought the cow, and we actually, um, and I said, I like part of this donation to go to help this old lady that I know in my village. And Hillary and I went and seeked her out, and we found her because she that used so awesome. she used to live under a bridge, and then we found her. She was living with this family, so and she had just broken her ribs. So we came in, and I was like, let's just buy her like a mattress so that she doesn't have to sleep. You know, she just broke her rib. So, and so this is like in your village. You're talking about this is like pretty intense poverty. Oh yeah, I, I come from a small village uh, in Vietnam. It's called San Doc. And it's very small. I mean, that's where I grew up. That's where my mom's side, you know. And up until now, the cars were not, you couldn't drive cars, like four-wheel cars in my village because there was no street. The, the, the roads were not wide enough. Like, only you could only get to my grandma's house uh, by motorbike or by boat. And just now, they just widened, maybe in the last three or four years, the road to where cars could come in. I mean, that's a huge change. It is. It is a huge change. But it's it's a very sleepy, small fishing village, you know, and they don't see a lot of foreigners. So when I bring in Hillary Brown, you know, who is this blonde hair, blue, uh, brown eyed woman, you know, they're like, what, 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 who is this? But for me to come back with somebody to be able to like when I left Vietnam, the night I left Vietnam, I left Vietnam as a five year old who knew nothing. And now I get to come in with with basically this woman that, that does great things for my country and for us to like step in together and say, let's do something and yeah. help this family and help that family. And it's such, it's not just throwing money at a problem. Exactly. I mean, that's why I love it. Like it's not just throwing money at a problem. You're giving people tools. Yes. Teaching them how to farm. And like you were telling me earlier when they're like, you're not just like saying, okay, here's your cow. But, uh, yeah. 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 I mean, there are doctors who will come in and like veterinarians that mm -hmm. will help them. Um, I mean, the service is incredible. So you're coming back to your home country, like from a real place of love and compassion. Yes. And I remember, um, I was probably four. So I, I, I have memories back to us four, and I was, I was a little kid in my village in, in Sundog. And I remember it was a group of Russians walking through our village and we were like oh my gosh the russians the russians like we were just in awe because we've never seen anybody other than vietnamese people in our village you know and and i was just like i ran after them and i, I tripped and i fell in the mud um but i remember just like it's neither here nor there <laughs> yeah because i came home and like my mom was like why are you all dirty it's like well i was running after the russians and i fell <laughs> but i was just it was just like seeing you know spider-man or, or iron man it, yeah. it was just like, wow, that's foreigners. So now to be to come back to my village, what? So when I came back, that was in 2015. How old was I in two, How old were we in 2015? I'm not good with math. 39. So left when I was five. Come back at 39. With the 37. I'm not good at math either. W with the tools. We're to, Gemini's. Yeah, we're Gemini's. We can't be expected to know yeah. these things. And I should be able to know this because I'm Asian, right? Asians should be good with yeah, math, but I'm your not. Problem. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a very proper Asian, but to come back to my village at that time with, um, with how, and to be able to say, Hey, we're not going to change everyone's lives, but for these people, we're going to help you. Is there any part of you that has almost like survivor's guilt when no. you go back? No, I don't. I, I, that question has been asked a lot of me because like, I don't feel guilty because I got out because I know like the route that I took to get out and the, and the things that I had to do to get back to where, or to be where I am now, Yeah, there is no survivor's guilt, but I always come back no, and because I, you worked so because I worked so hard for it. And I, and that's what I tell the people when I come back and I get to sit down with them because, um, they're always, uh, taken because they're like taken um back because they're like oh you speak Vietnamese I was like yeah I do speak Vietnamese and I sit there and I get to have conversation with these these families that we help you know and I share with them as like hey I grew up poor and I escaped as a refugee and I always knew like once I got out I will be back I don't know in what form in what way but I will be able to come back because I want to be able to say Hey, I got out. So now I could do someone to help someone back there. Only because when we were living in the um, in the camps, one of my mom's relatives, I don't know who it was, 
but she, I remember she sent us $20 and you know, like you sit in here at $20, what's that? Like two, two coffees for us at Starbucks, mm -hmm. but $20 for me and my family when we were living in the refugee camp was so many meals for us. And I remember that. So for me, I don't feel guilty that I yeah. made it, but I, I feel like now that I made it to this point in my life to where I live a comfortable life, I'm not rich, but I'm not poor. And I can, you know what, skip a meal and come back and help these people. Yeah. Well, I want to give all of us a chance to help all of these people. So we're going to put this organization that you care so much about. We'll put that up online. We'll put some photos. I'll put it on Facebook and Instagram yeah. and everything. That'd be great. So um, I think this will probably go out just after Christmas. So maybe it'll be our New Year's resolution to help out. But I mean, Tan, your story is so unbelievable. And your survival instinct is so strong. I mean, I hear that. And I look at my own kids who are the exact same ages, mm -hmm. you know, of you and your brothers at these various stages in life. And they, you know, they have no idea. And I had no idea, you know, I had a real normal middle-class childhood. So thank you so much for sharing your experience with me. Like, again, it's like, we've known each other for this long and I've never heard this story from start to finish. And Shannon, that's, that's the, the, everybody, you know, it's, you don't have to look very far for someone that has an amazing story. You know, it's, I, we were together for how many years now, you know, and we're same age and we all, you, myself have all these great stories. It's, I, I think me traveling around the world in the cow suit, it's just like, you just have to sit down and listen. Yeah. And there's so many stories right in front of your face yeah. that, that you don't know about. If you just take the time to listen you will hear so, so much. No, it's so true. Tan, thank you so much for sharing this yeah. with me and with everybody. Yeah. And um, it just really makes me want to help you out. And it makes me realize I feel guilty actually that I've never gotten this full story from you before because you're a goofy, fun person to hang out with. And I feel like, like I feel like it's taken me way too long to sit down and like get this real piece of your heart out. So yeah. thank you so, so much. You're welcome. And, um, you know, I found a quote that I, can I read it to yes, you? And I, I think it just summarized up, you know, this, this whole thing. Um, and it's a quote by Khalil Gibran and it says out of suffering have emerged the strongest souls. The most massive characters are seared with scars. And I think that's, that's, that speaks to all of us. You know, nobody has the perfect life and it's those scars that we grow up with that just, built our character and it just make us who we are. And we could either say, well, blame who made those scars or just take pride with those scars and say, guess what? I have so many scars, but it's made me the person who I am today. It's so true. I just read, I actually just read this reflection in this book I got and it says basically the same thing where it's sort of like you take hits in your life but it's sort of like a pebble hitting a mud puddle. And when the mud dries that those hits shape you mm -hmm. and you know, we all take our hits in different ways. Mine was not spending a week in open water mm -hmm. trying to go to Malaysia, but, but your experience helps me have a deeper understanding of humanity and why it's so important to keep an open heart to people who have nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I mean, thank you for, for listening to my story today. Oh, I love you, Tammy. Thank you so love much. You Out of suffering have emerged the strongest souls. The most massive characters are seared with scars. Thank you so much, Tan, for opening up and opening up to everyone listening. What a way to start off this new year with the intent of mindfulness, helpfulness, and reaching out to the people that need it. Please check my show notes on right in front of my face.net. I'm also going to put them up on Facebook. I'm going to give you all the information you need to donate to helping orphans worldwide. Thank you, Hillary Brown for supporting this podcast. And thank you again, Tan for showing us another way to help make a difference in our world. 
please, please get in touch with me at www.rightinfrontofmyface.net through email in front of my face at gmail.com on Instagram at right in front of my face Twitter I am my handle is at in front of my face thank you so much everybody for listening I am dangerously close to a thousand downloads and I'm really excited about it so if you like what you hear please please go onto iTunes rate my podcast the saying goes, if you hate, don't rate. So if you have something to say uh, that's negative, please feel free to reach out and email me. I am actually listening and open to critique and notes. Otherwise, please enjoy and please, please share. Tell people you know about this podcast and help get the word out. I am starting from scratch, so every little bit of support helps. Thank you so much. And this week, as you move forward... Take that extra one minute to dig a little deeper, to ask another question, to get to know somebody you've known for a really long time a little bit better because you never know what is happening right in front of your face. 